Howdy folks, welcome back for another Feature Friday. I'm your host Ryan Glover and this week we're going to be talking about deep linking with tabs. Uh, and you'll also notice that I've changed things up a little bit here. So usually I, I do the, the introductory video for these, uh, kind of sitting in front of my desk and I, I do the, the shot like that. But I figured, you know what, I want to I wanna make these uh, move a little bit quicker for you folks so you can just kind of jump in and learn stuff. So uh, I think moving forward what I'm going to do is just kind of kick these videos off so you, uh, you don't have to listen to me ramble like this. Uh, so deep linking, what do I mean by that? So deep linking is when you have nested UIs and right here I'm looking at the what is ultimately the view product screen inside of command the upcoming SAS uh, from Clever Beagle and some of the stuff you've seen if you've been watching these the past few weeks are things like the cards tab uh, we might have talked about versions a little bit and right now my focus is on the settings panel and so the the thing that I realized is that you can't actually get to these, at least not easily, meaning I'm able to click on cards. So let's refresh the page. And what was happening before is I was able to click on a tab, but if I refresh the page, I was always getting booted back to the cards tab, meaning if I wanted to refresh because maybe something broke or maybe I, I just wanted to refresh. Sometimes you maybe you don't get your data pulled down or something like that. Um, but what I realized was every time I did that, my UI was redirecting me back to cards. And so something that I, I spent a little bit of time working on over the past few weeks was this concept of deep linking. So what you'll notice, as I change between all of these tabs, so I say cards, versions, settings, you'll notice that my URL is updating to match where I'm at in those tabs. So as you'd expect, if I refresh the page now, I land on the versions tab as opposed to having to go back through the cards tab and click on versions again. And this is a really tiny detail and I almost didn't do this video, um, but I have seen this in other products um, where they leave this out and it's really, really frustrating and it's a nice UX detail. So I figured why not uh, talk about how I did this. So let's focus on the settings tab because you'll notice that the settings tab has even more nesting than these other tabs. So here with cards, um, it's literally the, the slash product slash the ID of the product slash cards uh, and same thing with versions. So slash product slash product ID slash versions uh, and there's no further nesting. But where this started to get interesting was with uh, even more nested tabs. So in this case I have a settings panel for a product but that settings panel has a general page, a team page, and an integrations page. And this one actually stumped me for a second, so I figured let's, let's dig into it. So if we jump over to the code and look at how I'm doing this, the first thing I want to talk about is the routing. So all of this UI is contingent or dependent on um, how the router, meaning the, the thing that renders things to the page based on the URL, it's all contingent on how that's set up. So if we look, no matter what, I'm looking at what I refer to as the view product component. Uh, and if we go and look at that real quick, the view product component is all of my tabs. So we'll notice here I've got the, the name of the product, its logo, and view public roadmap. So that's all this stuff up at the top. Uh, but then I've also got this series of tabs. So we've got our cards tab, versions tab, and settings tab here. Uh, and the idea is that depending on which tab is currently selected, and you can see this component expects an active tab and in, in this specific context I pull that off of uh, the prop so I do it based on the URL uh, and based on whatever tab I detect as the active tab that's what gets rendered to the screen. Uh, now that's all well and good but that doesn't necessarily work in combination with the router by default and so if we look at what I'm doing here so I'm saying on props I expect there to be something called match.params.tab. And if you're not familiar with routers or more specifically React Router version 4, so I don't know the specific version, but it's the, the V4X variant of React Router. Um, what I know is that when I render a page inside of my router, it's going to give me a match object with a dot params object. And match.params corresponds to different chunks of the URL. And so what I mean by that is if we look here I've got the product ID 
as what's known as a route parameter. And so if you look here, I'm saying slash product slash product ID. So if we go back to the app, and now this is inside of PUP, which is Clever Beagle's boilerplate for building products, and it's free to download MIT license, so you can download this and build with the exact same tooling that I am. Uh, the idea here is that when I define my routes, that route can have different things called params in them. And params are always denoted by, you'll see, a colon and then some name. And the, the way to think about that is it's some variable name. So in this case, if we go in here, you'll notice that I have a route at the top of my entire list of routes. And this is saying slash products slash and then colon ID. So what I'm effectively doing there is I'm saying, okay, that is a route where everything after slash, slash products slash. So everything after this chunk is going to be dynamic, or at least this part of the URL is going to be dynamic. And so because I know that that's going to be the product ID, I can take that in from that match.params object and I can utilize it. So I could use it to load some data and things like that. So if we go back to view product, you'll notice at the bottom of the file, I've got a GraphQL container here. And this is taken from the React Apollo package. So again, Apollo is the uh, client side library that I use inside of PUP to handle uh, making GraphQL queries and handling the cache of the data that I get in response to those GraphQL queries. And so what this is doing is it's saying when this view product component is loaded, what I want to do is run this query. So this is called product query. We're not going to look too specifically at that. The point I want to make here is that I'm saying when this loads, we're going to have this options object. And you'll notice that options takes in an argument, which is assumed to be an object. And I know it's an object because I'm using ES60 structuring here. So that's when you, you have an object value, but you only care about certain properties on it. You can use destructuring to literally spread it open and say, I just want that one. So an analogy I use when I'm mentoring folks uh, at Clever Beagle is thinking about like you have a bunch of grapes and you only want one specific grape that you're trying to pluck off. And so that's what destructuring allows us to do. And here what we're saying is we want to destructure props. So props are literally whatever properties have been passed down to this component. And I know that by virtue of rendering a component via the router, meaning back over here, if we look for, let's find out exactly where it is. So I've got a lot of doodles in here. Um, let's see, is it this guy? Where is it? Oh my Lord, there it is. Okay, so we've got slash product slash ID slash tab. So ignore tab for a second, just focus on ID. So we'll notice that when this route is a match, meaning the URL up here matches that pattern. So in this case, let's go, let's clean this up and we'll go to slash cards. So when we have the pattern of slash products, slash some ID, slash some tab on that product page. Don't let that overwhelm you too much. Uh, what we're saying is slash products, slash ID, so ID here is going to match this ID up here. And then we're saying slash tab after that, so we also expect this to be dynamic. And by dynamic, I can change this to any of the tab names here. So if I say versions and tap that in, now match.params.tab just changed to versions, while match.params.id stayed exactly the same. So that's the basic concept at play here is we're saying, dependent on what those values are in the params object, we want to do something. So the basic version here, if we go back to my routes list, is I'm saying, okay, when you match a URL that looks like what we just looked at in the browser, render the view product component, no matter what. We don't care which tab you're looking at in the view product component. And remember, the view product component is made up of several different tabs and several different screens. So we're looking at the same box no matter what, but within that box, we're gonna to change to something else. And so that's what the params are helping us do inside of the view product component. So if we look here, what I'm saying is no matter what, when the view product component loads, I wanna use 
that match object, which contains dot params as a sub property. So we're saying match dot params dot underscore ID. What I'm saying is give me the ID that's in the URL or that's in the position of ID in the URL. So I could just as well call this slash product slash pizza and you'll notice that gets me a 404 because I couldn't load that data, so it doesn't exist. Um, but if I put in an actual product ID, I'll get back an actual product. And so that's what's happening here. Behind the scenes, this is saying, okay, I'm gonna pass this ID up to the server or up to the GraphQL server, and then it's going to resolve that query for me. It's gonna send that product data back down to the client for me. So that's part one in this equation. So I have a route with different params that I expect in it and in response to those params I'm going to load something. So in this case we're loading the view product component no matter what. Now where this gets interesting is in when I have nested data. So if we, we pay a little more attention to this tab uh, parameter right here, no matter what we're still loading view product but let's go back to view product and look at how that's being used. So if we go into the render. Remember, I have this active tab variable here that I'm pulling off a of prop. So here I'm using the lodash.get method. So lodash is a library with a bunch of utility functions for JavaScript code that help you do things that you don't want to write the long version for. So it's condensing down certain things. And in this case, lodash.get is helping me to avoid having to write something like this.props and and this.props.match and and, and and so on and so forth. Um, and so it's a really neat tool to use in this context because what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, if this dot props contains a dot match dot params dot tab value, I want access to it or I want it returned to me. If it doesn't, then what I want is just a null value, so I know it doesn't exist. Uh, and so if we look, I'm taking active tab and I'm passing that to my tabs component. So what that's doing is it's saying, and remember, and this is, this is the hard part conceptually to wrap your head around, I'm still within the view product component. So if I go to versions, I'm looking at the versions page within the view product component. So don't let that confuse you. So what I'm doing is based on that URL, I'm saying, okay, this is the tab that I want to render. And so the tab that I want to render is that active tab variable here which I'm now pulling off of the match params object, which is given to me by the router when it renders the view product component. So here again, we have slash products, slash ID, slash tab. I'm rendering the view product component, and now as part of that process, I'm going to have an ID, and I'm gonna have a tab param that I can get access to. And so with that variable, active tab, back down here, and this is, specific to my UI. So you might not use a tabs component. You might just have some basic logic that says uh, if active tab equals, uh, in this case, we'll say versions, uh, you might render like a versions component. So we'll just say uh, render versions. The principles at play are exactly the same. The only difference is I'm using a component that's designed a certain way to take in that active tab value and render a tab but you can use it just the same like this um, and the, the same exact principles between uh, the router and the params and all of that stuff will work perfectly fine. Um, so moving forward, now that we understand that, we know that, okay, we're loading an active tab and that active tab is gonna render a component. So we either have our product cards, we have our roadmap, uh, or we have the settings. And this is the one I wanna focus on because we have that deep link that we need to get to. So you'll notice that the product settings component here is taking in history and match. And this is super important. So uh, again, match here is what you'd expect. That match value is identical to the match that's passed to view product. So all we're doing is we're relaying that match object, which contains our params down to a child that we have. And the reason we're doing that is because we need to be able to update the URL based on wherever we're at. Meaning, if I'm on the settings tab, I'm still technically at slash product slash ID slash settings. And slash settings is, so let's ignore general for a second here. So I'm at one of the child tabs of the view product component. 
So I'm still looking at view product, but now settings has its own little world or its own children that we have to handle. And so back here, I need to know where are we currently, meaning where are we currently in the URL or in the browser. And so I'm going to pass that down as well. And then history uh, is another object that we're going to get passed to us via the router. So back here, we've defined our route for slash products, slash ID, slash tab, which is going to render the view product component. And just like we saw, the router is passing behind the scenes. We don't actually see this, but behind the scenes, we're being passed match, like we already saw. We're also being passed history. And history is an object with a bunch of different uh, functions and values for telling us how to manipulate the history or allowing us to manipulate the history of the browser, meaning where are you currently? So if I refresh this, the current history stack is telling me that I'm at sla slash product, slash ID, slash settings, slash general. Now if I go back, the last position I was at, and let's go, there we go. So the last position I was at was slash product, slash ID, slash version. So all of those are different points in history. And in order to go to another point in history or to add to that history, meaning, okay, we're at versions. And then if I go forward, we're at slash settings slash general. If I go forward again, you'll notice my browser history grays out. I can't go forward in time. So using the history object that we get from the router, there's a function on it called history.push, which allows me to push another value onto that history stack. And so I can effectively redirect the browser somewhere. And so keeping that in mind, we take in history as a prop on the view product component. And then I'm passing that down as a prop to product settings. Now product settings is the component that's rendering uh, this little navigation on the left and whatever the current uh, setting panel is that's on screen. So if we look into that component, let me make sure I didn't break nothing here before we go any further. Uh, yeah, we're good. All right, so in the product settings component, we're going to see a lot of the same patterns at play. Uh, the first of which you'll notice is that when the constructor for the product settings component, so this is what's fired when product settings is first put on screen, or in this case, uh, when we switch to the settings tab in view product, we're going to render product settings. So the very first thing that happens, you may think, uh, if you're experienced with React, you may think, well, wait, doesn't component did mount fire first? No. So the constructor is literally like, uh, if you can imagine a factory and we're saying, okay, we're going to build a little gadget called product settings. The constructor is all of the robots starting to put that product settings widget together. And so this is the very first thing that's going to fire when product settings as a component is loaded into memory. And so the constructor is saying, let's get this thing set up. And so I'm saying, OK, I want to set the default state for this component to have an active tab value. So this.state.active tab equal to, and here again, I'm using the lodash.get method to make my code a little bit cleaner. Uh, what I'm saying is off of props, I want to take that match object again and from its params value, I want to get a param called subtab. And now you may be saying, like, wait, subtab? We, we didn't talk about that. We haven't. Um, so what I'm saying is give me that value. And if that doesn't exist or that doesn't return for some reason, just default to general. And so general here is me saying, OK, by default, no matter what, we want to render the general tab on screen. And so back here, the general tab lowercase general here is the ID that I'm using down below. So we'll look. And so this column right here, so we've got our navigation items on the left hand side. So that's this part right here. And then on the right, the other column, that's where we're rendering our active tab. And so you'll notice that the logic here is exactly the same as view product. I'm just using a different mechanism for achieving the same thing. That might be a little confusing. So what I mean is here, based on whatever I decide the active tab is, based on my URL, I'm going to use a tabs component to render a tab. All right? Now, the same exact thing is happening here. I'm saying, OK, based on the active tab that I detect from the match parameters or the URL parameters, I'm going to render some content on screen. 
but you'll notice I didn't say tabs. The only difference at play here is that I'm not using a purpose-built component for flipping between tabs. What I'm doing is I'm taking a standalone navigation element or navigation.items component and I'm saying, okay, based on the state of that component, I want to render something on screen. So if we look at what's at play here, I'm saying this state active tab, if that is equal to general, then I want to render product settings general. If it's equal to team, I want to just render team because I haven't built the component yet. So we'll say if I go back here and I click team, we'll see that team is what's rendered. Now, where this all comes together and where the deep linking part comes together is in how this all works when we change tabs. So you'll notice I click over here and the selected item changes as well as what's rendered on screen as well as our URL. And so this is where the deep linking comes into play. So remember that back in view product, when we render product settings, I'm passing history as a prop down to product settings. And again, history is that object we get from the router that allows us to change the history or manipulate the history. And so back in product settings, what we'll notice is when we click on a navigation item, I'm calling to this function handle change settings tab. And this is defined on the product settings component. So if we look at that, and we'll notice a few things going on. So the very first thing that I'm doing as I'm saying, when I call handle change settings tab, or rather when one of those is clicked on, so literally when I click here, here, or here, what I'm saying is, okay, pass the name of the tab that I clicked on. So in this case, general, or we'll keep team in mind. So when I do that, that is becoming active tab up here. And so I pass that to state. And the reason I do that is that state drives not only what the active navigation item is that I've clicked on, but it also is controlling what gets rendered in this settings panel. So again, whichever one I click on is controlling the render over here, and that controlling of the render is based on what the current state active tab value is. And so as I click on those, that's the very first thing I do. I update the local state to say switch to this tab. But then keep in mind, we want our UI to be deep linkable, meaning, and let's, let's put this into to a slightly better context, so, and less geeky. So, if I'm having a conversation with somebody in my company, and I'm going to say, oh, you know what, I'm trying to, to access this feature in command, but I can't um, get access to it. Can you manage that, or can you give me access to that? Um, somebody might say, like, yeah, can you point me to the products team page? What you don't want to have to do is like, oh, okay, yeah, go here and then click this and then click this. That's the point of the internet. That's how URLs work as a whole, is I should be able to give you an address and you can go directly to it. And so in order to make that work, we need that URL to exist. So technically, I can achieve this. I can flip between all these different pages without ever changing the URL. But if I don't do that, that means somebody's going to have to kind of find their way to that point every single time they want to access it. Whereas if I can just generate a URL, it makes it a lot easier. So here I'm on the integrations tab. Now I can just copy this and send it in a chat app somewhere. And I can say, yeah, here's, here's a link to the integrations page or here's a link to the team page if you want to manage somebody's uh, permissions inside of a product. So in order to achieve that, the first thing I'm doing is setting state. So we want to visually update what the, pe uh, not the people, uh, what the, the person using the application currently sees in the browser. So that's one. Now two is we need to update the URL to match wherever they currently are. So again, if they want to share that URL or if they refresh the browser or anything like that, they stay where they were, right? So back here, what I'm saying is, okay, after we set state, I'm using the callback function on this dot set state that's built into react. So whenever you call set state, you can set some state, so you pass a value to put onto state, and then you can use this callback function to say, okay, after that's done, go and do this. And so right here I'm saying, we wanna take history off of the props passed to the product settings component. So we can see down here, or back here I should say, in the view product component, remember we're passing history that view product is given via its props 
via the router. So we're kind of going down these levels. Again, this is deep linking. So we got to think in terms of like depth, like, okay, this is handed down, then this is handed down, then this is handed down. So once we have that inside of product settings, meaning the history object, now we can call the dot push method of that history object to say, hey, we want to push this new record onto the browser's history. So we want to say, which is effectively a redirect is what we're saying. We're saying push the user to this location or push them to this URL. And you can see here what I'm doing is I'm building that out. I'm saying I want to push you to slash products slash match.params.id. And again, if we look at our URL back here, that's this ID. Or in this case, we're looking at this one. So we're saying this ID. And then I'm saying, and let's move these around so I don't get confused. So I'm saying, okay, we want to go from slash products to whatever the ID of the product you're looking at is, slash settings, and then slash active tab. Now this is important. So params is informing us which product we were looking at. And notice everything else is hard coded because I'm in the product settings component. So I know that you're at the very least looking at the settings page for this product. So I can infer for the most part, this part of the URL. But then as we switch tabs, meaning as we switch these, so we're going between general team and integrations, that's dynamic. I don't know what you're picking. I don't know what that's going to be. So I take that active tab that's being passed to handle change settings tab down here. So I'm saying on click of a tab, tell us which one you clicked. And so we're setting it on the state. And then we're also updating the URL to say, go to this product settings page slash whichever tab we clicked on. So if I go to slash team, I go to team. And you'll notice our URL updates to slash product, slash the product ID, slash settings, slash team, slash integrations, same exact thing. Uh, so now if I refresh, no matter what, I land on that page. And the reason why is because we've not only updated the URL, but we're funneling back down that URL and those parameters by extension down to this component. So if we rewind a little bit here, back in the router, I have a route called slash products, slash ID, slash tab, slash sub tab. So a good way to think about this is I have a pattern that I can match against in the URL. So we'll notice, and let's see if I can mess this up. So I'll just put some gibberish at the end of this. Notice I get a, a nice 404 page. And the reason why is that pattern is not matched by anything in my list of routes. So it doesn't matter that I find the exact match, meaning the exact same values that I type in the URL match. It's about the pattern matching. So here, if I don't have slash product slash some dynamic value slash some dynamic value slash some dynamic value, I'm not going to match anything. I don't know what to do with that. But as soon as I match that pattern, so we'll get rid of my random URL. Oh, hey, that pattern matches something. And then using the code that we just saw, I'm taking that pattern or that match and I'm doing something with it. So here what the, what the doing is, okay, when we match some variant of this pattern, we're going to render the view product component. And then the view product component is smart enough to know, okay, well, let's take the parts of that pattern and do something. So the first do something is render the view product component. Done. Now, if we go back and again, remember, we have ID, tab, sub tab as parameters. So I'm saying, okay, inside of here, uh, see now I'm mixing myself up. Inside of here, the view product component, what we're saying is, okay, tell us what the current tab is. So in this case, the current tab is settings. So that's where view product essentially stops in this equation. So it's saying, I can give you up to the point of the equation of this. So it's saying, I can give you everything up to slash tab. So past that point, it, it doesn't know what to do. So now, because we know that, okay, the active tab is settings, back down here, we're telling our tabs component to render the settings tab, right? And now that's going to render the product settings. And notice we're passing along history match to say, okay, now this is your responsibility to do something. So we don't know what that is, but we know that it has to do something. And then internally inside of product settings, when it's constructed or when it's first rendered in memory, what we're saying is great. Now take those props and try and see if you can find a sub tab. 
And the reason we expect a subtab is because that's the nature of this specific component. It's saying, okay, I have subtabs to offer you, so I should expect to have a subtab parameter. And that's, that's a, a design thing. That's not how this necessarily works, um, depending on your own UI. That's just, because I've designed this to expect a subtab, I know internally in my component that I can reference that. If I didn't have a subtab, or even if I call it something else, like if I call it pizza, I would say, oh, I expect a param called pizza. Um, and then it's up to me to do something with that, or rather it's up to my code to do something with that. Uh, and so what happens then is when that pattern matches, we get view product, and then view product says, okay, now you gotta render settings. And now settings is gonna say, oh, I gotta render whatever this subtab is, which in this case, if we look back in the browser, what did I have? I have integrations. So it knows to set this state active tab inside of the product settings component to integrations. And if we go back down here, we can see when I'm on integrations, I'm telling it to render this paragraph tag integrations. And what's neat is that no matter what, I'm always going to end up on that page, whether I'm clicking around, and I mean end up on that page in the URL, whether I'm clicking around or if I'm just going to it directly. And that's all managed by that process of passing uh, the match params down for the URL and doing things based on different parameters. So that's kind of a doozy. And that's why I wanted to do uh, this feature Friday on this concept because it, it takes you a second to understand that. Uh, but once you get it, you realize that you can do some really powerful things uh, with your own UI. Uh, so that's going to do it. That kind of tuckered me out explaining that. Um, so that's the idea. You're, you're saying, okay, from a top level, I have some URLs that, that expect some pattern, and based on that pattern, I'm gonna render something, and then that something is gonna render something, and then that something, something, something is gonna render another something. Um, so definitely take some time to rewind this a few times if you're trying to build this UI, because it is, it is complex, it's not, um, immediately obvious what's happening. But once you understand the concept of one pattern rendering something and then that something is relying on that pattern to tell it something else, you'll start to see, oh, okay, I could technically infinitely nest things or I could infinitely do something. I don't really advise that because that might confuse the hell out of people and yourself, um, but it is possible. You can technically go you know, as far out as you want. Um, so with that, I'm gonna wrap up uh, as always, make sure to, if you haven't already, uh, click the red subscribe button down below as well as the bell that's right next to it so that, that way you get notifications as soon as I publish these. Um, and also, if you haven't already, uh, make sure to head over to cleverbeagle.com uh, slash subscribe. So that will get you on the mailing list where all of these come out every single week uh, as well as any other free resources that I publish. So uh, definitely take a look at that. and. Uh, yeah, signing off for the HMS Beagle. I'll see you next week. Oakley dokely, we're just doing a test run here. We're gonna try and see what we can do. Talking about, what are we gonna call this? This is like a nested tab routing. Oh boy, that's seductive. Nested tab routing. Uh, what is that? It's like, um, Mapping tabs to URLs, linkable tabs, deep links, deep linking, deep, deep linking. Actually, that's pretty good. Deep linking, deep, deep linking, deep linking. Link the deep. Um, I can get down with that.